Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, and welcome to today's webinar about PV sustainability. Um, today's agenda, I'll start with a short introduction. I'm Thomas Bursman, Product Manager at Solar Plaza. I'll tell you a little bit more about our upcoming future grid labs in uh, which perspective we're doing this uh, webinar for today. And then we'll do the presentation by Dr. Franz Lanzmann, uh, researcher and project manager at ECM, part of TNL. Uh, he will tell us more about PV sustainability and the life cycle of a PV system. In the end, we will have a Q&A. Uh, you can uh, already send the questions during the presentation, but I'll tell you more about it uh, just now. Uh, so the future grid labs, on the 17th of May, we will have a future grid lab on hydrogen. Our future grid labs are our innovative uh, half-day conferences in which we uh, aim to familiarize our network with certain topics. The first one will be about hydrogen. We'll talk about gray, blue, and green hydrogen, a technological roadmap, and sector coupling. Uh, besides, it will give a state of the market, uh, give an overview of the applications. It will be a half-day in which you'll get a full update on the possibilities that hydrogen offers. Uh, on the 24th of May, we'll do a Renewable Energy Asset Circularity Future Grid Lab. Uh, and that's also where we're going to talk about today. This is more uh, sci uh, focused on solar PV today, but we'll look at wind as well, batteries. Uh, we'll look into circular business models, uh, repowering, rebuilding, and reusing of these assets. And at the design phase, how can you design for disassembly? And then on the 27th of May, we'll have a future grid lab on customer centricity, where we'll talk about the democratization of energy and the rise of the prosumer and how this affects the roles and the responsibilities of the current stakeholders and the new entering stakeholders in the energy sector. We'll have a webinar about this uh, next week, so make sure to check that out as well. But now um, we'll move on to today's webinar. Uh, the practical details. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat box and we'll uh, help you there. If you have questions for Frank during the presentation, use the question box. Uh, send your questions during the presentation and I will ask them to Frank at the end of the presentation. Uh, most asked question of all webinars, will the recordings and slides be available afterwards? Yes, they will. You will receive an email with the recordings and slides a couple of days after the webinar. Then to today's webinar, uh, Dr. Frank Lanzmann, researcher and project manager at ECM, part of TNO. He will tell more about PV sustainability and the life cycle of a PV system. He will look at the environmental impact of a PV system, about the safety implications of PV systems, and so on. So, um, Frank, I'm going to hand over control to you. Thanks for joining us today. And um, if everything's all right, you should have control now and also sound. Very good. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Thomas, for the clear introduction. Let's start right away. Okay, uh, the topic is clear. It's about sustainability, and I will try to give you, let's say, in broadest terms, an overview of this topic you know, in what way does sustainability and circularity connect to photovoltaics? As Thomas has pointed out, obviously these topics also matter for other renewable energy sources, but obviously also for basically the whole range of products that our modern society uses in order to hopefully go into a more sustainable, let's say, more eco-friendly world in the future. Here is a little overview of what I'm going to tell you about, the three topics in bold, one, two, and three. These are the topics that you have probably seen in the invitation to this webinar. Um, you will hear more about them during the presentation, obviously, and I added to those those two topics that I marked as number zero and number four, nam namely an introduction and conclusions, so that there's some kind of a, a comprehensible frame of this whole topic for the audience. Let's start with the introduction. I always believe it makes sense to look a little bit back into the history of things. So 
I give you here on this sheet a little very short and selective chronology of these terms that we address today, namely sustainability and circularity. The term sustainability was probably first coined by a comp compatriot uh, of myself, namely a man of Germany. His name uh, was Hans Karl von Karlowitz. And you see here his image, not as a photograph, but as a painting. And the reason is simply that uh, the book that he wrote was uh, published already in the 18th century, actually in the early 18th century, while, as you know, photography only started to be around on our planet in the, ninth, uh, in the 19th century. So the book by Hans Karl von Karlowitz is very interesting in, this, uh, in, the, in the context of sustainability. It carries the title Silvicultura Economica, and this may not mean anything to you, uh, and therefore, I tell you that the background of this whole book is in essence to make the forestry uh, of that time, so the, the taking care of the woods and the, yeah, yeah, the wood uh, and the forest. Um, he, he described how to make this more sustainable. And the background is very simple that back then the mining uh, industry uh, and uh, metal industry and so on, they use uh, a lot of wood, so much wood that whole forests actually disappeared and that was a big, that started to be a big uh, a problem at the time and Mr. Karlowitz, who was some kind of a state employee in eastern Germany at the time, uh, in Saxony, uh, actually, um, he wrote a book about how to, uh, you know, make forestry more sustainable in the sense of not taking more wood out of the forest than, uh, you know, measures are being implemented to regrow the wood. In other words, to find a good balance between the consumption of the wood and the re-harvesting, let's say, uh, sorry, the re-regrowing re re of the wood. So the term sustainability in this historical context shows that, uh, let's say, the uh, arena where this, this topic comes from is often from, uh, uh, let's say, a perspective of shortages in also, so not to exhaust resources and so on. So interestingly enough, uh, I wanted to point that out that this term sustainability was probably for the very first time coined by this man here uh, in the 18th, early 18th century. Then a the thing that is, is probably more, more familiar to many uh, in the audience is the famous uh, uh, report, UN report, with the title Our Common Future by Gro Harlem Brundtland. I think she was uh, also the prime minister or some governmental employee uh, of Norway at the time. And uh, she and her commission, the Brundtland Commission, they coined this definition that is uh, shown here, um, and that is that sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this is a very general uh, definition of sustainability, which is still very useful in this general form uh, today and also used in this form today. Then uh, much more recent yet uh, is this, uh, work that I pointed out here uh, uh, as the third, uh, uh, let's say, block in the chronology here. This is a book and the work of these two people that are shown here, Mr. William McDonough, Dunnock, or whatever his name is, uh, I think he's American, and Mr. Braungart, uh, again, a German. 
and they came up with the idea with this concept of cradle to cradle remaking things the way we, we make things uh, a nice book title and obviously what that means is that you know cradle to cradle um, uh, as opposed to cradle to grave means that a product when it goes through its life cycle and i will tell you a lot more about life cycles uh, just in a middle little, little moment so when a product goes through its life cycle that it doesn't end up necessarily as a waste but that it, that it can be uh, actually the uh, new resource of a new product and this is a very interesting concept and uh, i remember when i first heard about this cradle to cradle concept this was in a newspaper article here in the netherlands written by mr braungart and this was a very interesting newspaper article in which he actually described the population of ants yes you're hearing correctly ants so these uh, little uh, insect creatures and what is so interesting about these populations is that they are obviously very sustainable but interestingly they are also generating a lot of waste and this is now the interesting thing in comparison to human beings these ants they actually generate per unit mass of their body weight a lot more waste than humans but the uh, tricky thing or the the, the good thing the the, the the good thing about this waste is the nature of the waste is benign to the environment so it doesn't destroy their living environment while in so many cases today the waste that we humans generate is actually intoxicating our own environment and and destroying also not only our own living uh, spaces but also the uh, the biosphere for other creatures and plants on this planet so what that means is that the waste itself is not necessarily the problem it is the nature of the waste that makes all the difference now i promised you to talk about life cycles for those few maybe uh, in the audience that are not familiar with this term already uh, let's focus here a little bit on the first image on the left which is a somewhat more classical product life cycle with very very typical phases of the product life cycle you know where you have somewhere you will probably start with the extraction of raw materials from the biosphere could be wood as we discussed before but it could be all kind of other ores or metals or whatever you need from the biosphere then those will be transformed of course in some way and uh, eventually they will end up in a production environment in this case i show here the production environment of solar panels because we talk about photovoltaics today so in this factory here uh, photovoltaic panels will be generated those will then be brought onto roofs or into fields and they will be installed there in other words they will come into a new phase of their life cycle and that is the use phase that is a very uh, uh, pleasurable phase of the product uh, for the owner he enjoys the electricity generation by these pv panels on the roof and finally after some time uh, and uh, what exactly that time will be we can discuss we will we'll discuss this uh, later in this presentation those panels uh, may up may end up as waste and they may so they may be disposed somewhere or they can be recycled or parts of it can be recycled and that is then sort of the end of the life cycle that's really the end of life here over here at least in this more classical product life cycle now in the somewhat more advanced product life cycles that incorporate the circularity or cradle to cradle thinking there the the total life cycle which is again shown as a circle here um, 
is somewhat more sophisticated, let's say. It includes more than only those four phases, more, uh, let's say, substantial um, uh, phases. And those phases include, for example, something like already uh, very early on, uh, before the actual production, there is a design phase. And obviously, this design phase is also over here in the more classical product life cycle. But typically, in the more classical product life cycles, the design uh, criteria were rather focusing on, you know, technical performance or maybe uh, uh, the cost of things. While here, what is really meant in this circular approach is that this is a design for sustainability. Uh, and to give you an example, for example, you could uh, think about already in this design phase over here, how you could most easily dismantle and take apart a product like, like such a solar panel at somewhere over here at the end of life so that you can either reuse, reuse, repair, or recycle this product at the end of life. So this is, this is what makes these more advanced circular product life cycles really uh, uh, a step forward into, uh, into a more sustainable quality. Let's talk now about renewable energies. Uh, Thomas has pointed out in his introductory words that the event uh, at the end of May, 24th of May, will deal about renewable energies as a whole, not only about photovoltaics. So let's look now uh, here a little bit very in a very broad uh, way, of, of course, in a very general way, about the intrinsic qualities of renewable energies in terms of sustainability and circularity. And this then in comparison to the fossil or nuclear-based uh, uh, energies. Now, if we look at the left-hand side here at the fossil and nuclear energies, these are characterized, uh, as many of you know, by emissions and not only carbon dioxide, emissions, there's also pretty problematic emissions of mercury, for example, in coal-fired power plants, as well as fine dust, obviously. Uh, but we are also having, um, of course, the exhaustion of energy resources. This is a big topic. Uh, everybody reads it in the newspapers every now and then uh, that the oil resources, for example, are going down. But this holds also true, obviously, for coal and gas, maybe on slightly different time frames. But these, these resources, they will run out at some point. So this is a characteristic of this energy supply technologies, the fossil and nuclear energy supplies. And the other thing, obviously, another big topic that played also a big role in the phasing out of nuclear energy uh, in many countries in Europe, uh, let's say, um, at least the plans to phase those, those out. Uh, this has to do with the radioactive waste uh, problem. If we compare on the other side, the renewable energies, they are virtually emission-free. There's no such ugly things like here on the left-hand side. There is also no exhaustion of energy resources because, uh, in essence, the basic background source of this energy is the nuclear fusion reactor of the sun, uh, which is fortunately uh, very, very far away. So we, uh, we are not exposed to the dramatic, let's say, physics that are happening there. And this uh, this huge energy source is, let's say, at least in the perspective or from the perspective of our human uh, uh, perspectives here on this planet, basically unexhaustible. There is, uh, this is, the sun is not going to stop shining. And the sun is really the basic energy source, not only for photovoltaics, so for making electricity from the sunlight, but it's also 
the source for wind energy because wind energy uh, obviously um, uh, let's say uh, comes about from thermal differences and it's also through the process of photosynthesis the source of bioenergies. Now one thing is nevertheless to be mentioned and that is that even renewable energies are not 100% uh, sustainable yet. There, we also have sustainability and circularity topics such as the possible exhaustion of scarce materials for the building of the devices, as well as uh, the waste of these devices at the end of life. So, this brings us now into the depths of the pre presentation. And among those three topics, the longest of those topics is number one. And uh, number two and number three, they, I treat them somewhat more briefly. So bear with me uh, uh, in the next, uh, say, 25 minutes. Let's start with the activities of the IEA PVPS Task 12. I uh, wrote out here exactly what that means. IEA PVPS means the International Energy Agency for the Water Power System. So this is a working group within the International Energy Agency. And you see here in this uh, in this box here that there is oops, I'm sorry. You go back up. You see here in this box that next to this task 12, which deals with PV sustainability, there's also many other tasks. I'm not going to read to you what those tasks do. They all deal with photovoltaics, but with other topics than sustainability. And like uh, all the other tasks, there is basically two project leaders in the frame of the AEA. These people have a somewhat more sophisticated name, namely operating agents. And the two people here that you see here are Garvin Heath from the United States and Andreas Wade from Germany. And Andreas, if all is well, will be present at the circularity event of Solar Plaza on the 24th of May in Rotterdam. And the task 12 working group consists of 12 members, 12 member countries, and this includes the big countries uh, that, let's say, the big countries that have a big uh, role in photovoltaics, that's China, Japan, G the US, Germany, but also Australia and the Netherlands are also part of task 12. And uh, there's also this uh, kind of uh, solar lobby organization, Solar Power Europe. So not only countries, but also organizations can be part of these task groups. And Solar Power Europe is the only non-country member, let's say, of task 12. Now, what exactly is the total scope of task 12? Here it is. You see this uh, task 12 work uh, program is subdivided into subtasks. And that is, for example, recycling of photovoltaics, life cycle assessment of photovoltaics. I'll talk about this later in the presentation, as well as other sustainability issues. And those are environment, health, and safety issues. So all these topics are covered in task 12. Now, what exactly is this task 12 doing about these topics? One thing that is uh, I think good to point out is that there are this task 12, uh, these people, uh, the representatives of the country, of the countries that I showed before, they meet twice a year. So there is definitely a networking going on and all the expertise from the countries, including country updates, what happens in the area of photovoltaics and sustainability in a given country leads to co collaboration and let's say a higher level of the knowledge. That's one thing. This knowledge also gets actually documented in reports. And these reports, they really set international standards and trends. 
and uh, they they influence definitely also the agenda in these uh, in these areas. Uh, you see here two examples the methodology guidelines for life cycle assessment of photovoltaic electricity. This is a report that was published, I believe, in 2015. And this is very much the standard for uh, life cycle assessment work in the area of photovoltaics. And there's other reports, you know, they all always have the same title page, so you can't tell from the title page what the uh, exact topic is. So, with all this uh, work, uh, I can say that the Task 12 Working Group certainly has a lot of uh, impact. It influences legal and re regulatory frameworks. And an example I will give later on in this presentation, where uh, I will talk about the current uh, initiative by the U European Union on eco-design and eco-labeling. Now, on the following eight slides, I will give you just some concrete snapshots of results generated by task 12 so that you see really a lot more concretely some of those results. One is shown here, and that is the project projection of PV panel waste from the current time, okay, this is 2016, this is three years ago, into the uh, near term and longer term future and not surprisingly if you know uh, the growth of photovoltaics is uh, spectacular this growth is shown here by the way in these uh, kind of yellow or green uh, bubbles today we are having about four to five hundred gigawatts so this this value is already outdated and the expectation is uh, that the growth will continue uh, 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 in, a, in, a, in a very aggressive way to reach uh, easily 10 times the current uh, capacity by 2050, maybe more than that. And this being said, uh, it is also not surprising that these panels at some point when they reach their end of life, they will generate a, a waste stream of PV panels. And as you see today, this waste stream today is super small. We are talking here about uh, only, you know, less than 50,000 or at maximum uh, hundreds, uh, small hundred thousands of tons. This is in terms of, you know, waste volumes of other products, uh, very uh, small, very small waste stream. And the reason why that is so small today is very simple and that is that the PV panels that are already being installed in the field today, and that's not an insignificant amount, but most of them are still in the field. <laughs> most of them are still in the roof or in the field, so they are not a waste yet. But this is obviously going to change and it's going to change quite fast. And as you see here, certainly by 2030, we will reach easily the you know the million tons uh, waste regime and by 2050 we will be approaching certainly the 100 million tons waste regime and the two colors that you see here the purple and the blue color they are just two different scenarios one is the early loss scenario and one is the regular loss scenario and the early loss scenario that's something uh, i will uh, explain to you a little bit later what, what that means. In fact, I'm going to explain that to you on the next slide. This next slide, sorry for the, uh, for the large amount of text there, but the information on this slide can only be communicated as a text because it was, an oral, it was an oral information actually provided from these country updates that I told you about already during the last Task 12 meeting, which happened in December 2018. And the points that I listed here, five points, they all come from the Chinese delegation. And China is by far the biggest uh, and most important country in the area of uh, photovoltaics, both in terms of production. I think by now, 70 to 80 percent of the worldwide uh, photovoltaics systems production happens in China, 
but also in terms of installation. And uh, what you see here is that China communicated to us that the uh, uh, the installation targets of China will increase again, uh, namely to a total cumulative volume uh, of around about 250 gigawatts. This is good news because last year there was a news that actually there was a slight, you know, lowering of those targets, uh, but this was just a temporary thing. And that means that within the next two years, we can expect uh, additional installations of 50 gigawatts per year in China. So the growth story of photovoltaic installations in China will continue. And um, now the next point is a very interesting one. And that is, uh, that's exactly what I meant before with the early loss scenario or early emergence of end of life modules. So typically uh, in the photovoltaic community, we say that a photovoltaic module has a technical lifetime of easily 20 to 30 years. And that is true. That has been tested and proven over and over again. However, uh, there can be um, economic reasons to dismantle a photovoltaic panel much earlier than at the end of its technical lifetime. The reasons can be that there are some minor performance losses. And uh, another reason can then be that if you have those performance losses and at the same time, very large price digressions and actually uh, higher efficiencies of new photovoltaic modules, and this is something that happens today, then you can be in a situation where you have an economic business case for, for what they call early repowering. In other words, you will have, for example, a PV field installations. And even though the panels in this field, they are, let's say, uh, working rather well, the, the um, owner of the park, of the PV park, can come to the conclusion actually economically interesting to dismantle those panels nevertheless and to replace them with those very low cost uh, uh, super high efficiency and uh, uh, high quality new panels and this means that you know what you saw before this early loss scenario this is highly realistic because we are talking here about the biggest market in the world namely the chinese market where this early repowering uh, happens apparently. This was the information by the Chinese delegation uh, at that meeting. So uh, that is really happening. This means that the PV re recycling market is expected to be significant by 2025 already. So that's that's really very soon, even though it, it it's worthwhile pointing out that also in China still valid business models are needed and, and uh, investigated. And without maybe going into too much more details, because I see that the time is running and we still have some more sheets to go through, uh, there is a lot of activity in China going on in the area of photovoltaic recycling. And we will see a lot of that uh, in the, you know, in the relevant um, news pages. Let's continue. Another uh, interesting topic is the value creation by PV waste management. Obviously, if you take care of your photovoltaic panel waste, for example, by recycling activities, then this is an economic activity that, you know, generates potentially economic profits of those companies that are active in there. And on top of that, it also generates um, it also generates employment. You see that here, employment. And the economic volume and potential value creation by this recycling market can be very substantial. It can be on the order of, you know, billions of dollars, certainly by 2050, uh, but already reaching hundreds of millions as early as 2030.
Now here we zoom in uh, uh, into a detail of uh, the economic potential of silver recycling. Uh, some of you, but maybe not all of you, will know that silver is one component in a photovoltaic panel. It's actually the component that is responsible for the uh, electrical conductivity uh, of, the, of, the, of the electricity that is generated there. And this compound is in a PV panel in a very, very small, there's only very small amount if you look at it from a um, weight perspective. It's only 0.05% weight percent in the PV panel uh, consists of silver. But if you look at the end of life economic value of this, uh, of this tiny amount of uh, silver, then it's almost half of that economic value. So this, this uh, you know, brings you very easily to the conclusion that even though this is a very diluted compound in the PV panels, it's extremely interesting, economically speaking, to recycle that silver. Another interesting case is the case of silicon. Obviously, you find silicon in photovoltaic panels. The solar cells are made out of silicon. And um, also, this compound is actually, if you look at the panel weight, relatively small. It's only 3% because the largest amount of the weight is actually the front glass. This represents most of the weight of the panel, only 3% of the silicon. But if you look in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, the CO2 emissions uh, that are uh, correlated with this photovoltaic panel, then the silicon, this small amount of silicon re represents, uh, you know, the overwhelming part, almost 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So this brings you then fast to the conclusion that from an environmental point of view, this uh, recycling of silicon is certainly an interesting thing to do. And by the way, also the economic value of the silicon can be quite significant, in particular if you are able to recycle it on a high quality grade, and that high quality grade is referred to here as solar grade, compared to the somewhat lower quality grade, which is this metallurgy metallurgical grade uh, silicon. Uh, well, these are just simply, this sheet shows simply uh, the, the, the basic principles of uh, PV waste management, where all these different strategies, uh, you know, can be followed. And uh, the, the, the most um, preferential, you know, you have a preference for simply preventing waste or minimizing waste, reusing, recycling, and only if you can't do anything else will you, you know, will you choose to uh, really deposit uh, your waste somewhere on a landfill or maybe uh, dispose of it in a waste incineration plant. And this graph you've seen before in the, on, on the sheet, in, on the earlier sheet about the life cycles. Here's yet another information from the task 12 group. And that is that there is already today a lot of regulatory and legal frameworks for recycling of photovoltaic devices. Uh, we're talking here about um, uh, these two European directives. Some of you will have heard of them before the European WE Directive, which deals with electric, electrical and el electronic waste. And the other one is the uh, ROSE Directive, Restriction of ha Hazardous Substances. And without going into the details of these directives, they also apply to photovoltaic devices. And um, um, many countries realize the front running position of Europe uh, in having those type, type of directives to protect the, you know, the environment, our living environment. And so many of them are uh, installing now regulatory frameworks that are often based on these directives. For example, we heard during that meeting that Australia and South Korea are drafting now regulations uh, very much based on those uh, existing European directives. 
Okay, this is just a, a special um, comment here that uh, actually photovoltaic panels are exempt uh, uh, from the ROS directive, uh, at least on cadmium compounds. And the re reason is that first solar, which is the most significant company uh, producing a very special type of uh, solar panels. So typically you don't have cadmium solar panels, but in the, uh, in the thin film photovoltaic modules by PV solar, you have, uh, by, sorry, by first solar, you have cadmium. And uh, since they have uh, extremely um, uh, good recycling system, so they collect their PV panels at the end of life and uh, completely recycle those panels and avoid any leakage of cadmium into the environment. And for that reason, uh, they received an exemption from the ROSE directive because the regulatory uh, offices saw it, uh, you know, that it was the, the cadmium uh, in the case of this product was taken care of by the measures uh, uh, taken by the company. Um, here again, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, this is just to point out that there is a lot of init initiatives currently going on on the European uh, Union level to install new um, um, well, new eco labels and energy labels, and you see here a timeline. Um, we are we have already had uh, several stakeholder meetings to come up with these new labels, and there will be a new third and last stakeholder meeting very soon, and then there will be policy recommendations, and by the by 2021, approximately, uh, we can expect that these new labels uh, will be around and they will obviously help to encourage and promote more sustainable product designs. And now, um, even though it looks like we are, only, we are only in the middle of the presentation, there's only a few more slides, so um, let's go through them. In terms of, sorry, let's jump back. In terms of quantifying the environmental profile of photovoltaics, this is typically done by life cycle assessment. And life cycle assessment, for those that don't know it, this is a method to quantify environmental profiles of goods and services. And such an environmental profile can also be called an environmental footprint. This can, uh, you know, be all kind of uh, characteristics that you can see, let's say, as characteristic for this environmental footprint, namely things like greenhouse gas emissions, human toxicity, uh, you know, water uh, toxicity, metal depletion, and so on and so on. There's a whole range of characteristics that you can quantify if you know exactly how a product is being made. And uh, this relates again to analyzing, in essence, all the processes that happen during the life cycle of a certain product. And this, uh, this certain product, in our case, obviously, is a photovoltaic panel or a photovoltaic system. What you do then is, in essence, so you collect all these kind of quantitative production data about the production of the PV panel or the setting up of the PV plant in a field or on a roof. And all this information gets uh, analyzed in a software, computer-based software, and then you will get quantitative information about all these properties that I pointed out in the sheet before. And I will show you two examples now. Here's the first one. One of those uh, characteristics of the environmental footprint is the energy payback time of a PV system. And down here, you see a definition of this energy payback time. That is the time that is needed to recuperate all the energy that was needed originally to produce 
and install the PV system. So you need some energy to make the system and when the system is then operational, it will generate energy and at some point it will, gener it will have generated so much energy that you kind of um, uh, yeah, compensate for the energy that was used to produce it in the first place. That's the energy payback time. And here you see this energy payback time. The data are already a little bit outdated, but not, not that much has changed since, since then. And you see, in essence, that the energy payback time of photovoltaic systems today is on the order of, uh, let's say, one to two years. And obviously, you can then use these kind of analyses to focus on differences between different um, uh, production processes. And so in this way, you can optimize the energy payback time even further. And uh, today, as we speak, uh, we certainly have uh, a perspective of seeing quite soon energy payback times below one year. Another example is the carbon footprint of PV systems. And uh, in essence, uh, the analysis shows that the carbon footprint of PV electricity is on the order of 20 to 30 grams CO2 equivalents per kilowatt hour. And if you compare that, for example, with coal-based electricity, you see that this is, you know, just a tiny fraction, much less than 5% of the carbon footprint of coal-based electricity. And so this is why we talk about a very sustainable electricity source when we talk about photovoltaics. And it can get even more sustainable in the future through further system optimizations, as I pointed out before. Last topic, just another two slides to go, I believe, before the conclusions. Here we go. Um, we, if we talk about environmental impacts, then uh, one of those environmental impacts can also be the integration of photovoltaic systems into the environment into the landscape. And here you see an example. Uh, of course, it's not a photograph. This is just an artist's impression of a PV park as it's integrated in a, in a pretty nice way in a, in a, um, in a um, uh, sort of park environment. So you can have um, photovoltaic systems that serve multiple purposes in the areas where they are uh, integrated. This can be, for example, recreational areas where the PV panels don't uh, disturb the recreational value of that landscape. But there's also other examples, like, for example, the combination of photovoltaics with agriculture. This even has a, a, a term in itself. It's called agro for agriculture, agro photovoltaics. And these systems, they simply install the PV panels on somewhat longer poles. So the PV panels, they are elevated above ground, maybe by something like two meters or so, so that even agricultural vehicles can still uh, go underneath those panels. And the panels can even add value to the agriculture by the shadow that they generate uh, to the to the crops underneath uh, and the the coolness that that comes with it the last sheet of this presentation is here uh, that relates now to health and safety issues all of those health and safety issues that you may also have uh, been uh, seeing in the news uh, papers uh, for uh, some time is that uh, in some cases there can be uh, the emergence of a fire that is uh, really originating from a photovoltaic system. Um, the community takes that problem uh, very seriously. Uh, for example, here 
um, at my research organization TNO uh, just published a report about this issue for the uh, let's say focusing on the Netherlands in that case and even though the picture that you see here obviously looks very dramatic and when you are the unlucky person that uh, that is exposed to a fire from a PV system then this is a big disaster but nevertheless it is worthwhile to put that into the context of these numbers here for example there has only been 23 cases uh, found in the Netherlands last year uh, and that co compares to 170,000 PV systems that were installed in that same year so it's it's certainly not a very frequent problem but nevertheless a serious problem obviously and the in this report which is i think 60 pages long unfortunately it's in dutch so the english speakers in the audience they will not be able to read that report but there are certainly english speaking reports of this kind as well that you can find and probably you will also find in those reports the conclusion that uh, we found namely that a very typical reason for those fires is not the PV panel itself, but in uh, most cases, the origin is a bad cable connection, and that can often have to do with unprofessional installers that you know use um, uh, cable connections that are not meant to be together. For example, they use a, a connector and a cable from different producers that don't fit properly together and then you can have all kinds of electrical and heat issues at these connection points that can in the worst case then even lead to a fire so yes it is a serious health and safety issue these fires but at the same time uh, we look carefully into it and it can easily be solved so it's by no means an intrinsic a problem uh, that we need to worry can generate a stumbling block for the you know for the development of photovoltaics in the future this brings me to the conclusions more or less in time and uh, so i hope i have been able to convince you that the task 12 working group uh, does quite useful work and furthers the sustainability of photovoltaic systems um more, a second point is that uh, i hope i can uh, was also able to show you that pv sustainability is already extremely strong today it's a truly green technology but it can be and should be further improved so that it becomes eventually a very powerful backbone of the circular economy and uh, as a third takeaway message I think uh, proactive exchange and research and development in the area of PV sustainability and circularity is something that is useful and pays off. And uh, in this context, certainly uh, the Solar Plaza uh, Renewable Asset Circularity event next uh, on the 24th of May in Rotterdam is uh, a useful thing to visit for people in the audience as well. Thanks a lot for your interest in this topic and I'm uh, curious about your questions and happy to answer them. Thanks a lot, Frank. Um, thanks, first of all, for a very interesting presentation, very thoroughly and I think uh, very all encompassing. Uh, I think for the sake of time management, uh, we'll uh, limit the amount of questions. So I'll pick out the topics that get the most questions. And uh, I think uh, a couple of questions came in about the energy payback time, because uh, the data was quite old, but you mentioned that it doesn't really uh, make a difference. But uh, I, over time, uh, we got questions about uh, efficiency uh, improvements, but also about the energy mix changing uh taxes or incentives taking into account uh, how can it be that it didn't change that much or uh, could you at least elaborate a bit more on how that works yes uh you know uh, as i pointed out on another slide uh, is that most of the 
embodied energy. In other words, most of the energy that you need in order to make a PV panel is simply in the silicon wafer. And uh, there has not been, you know, the, 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 the wafer thickness has gone down in the course of time. The current industry standard, I think, is uh, somewhere on the order of 160 to 180 microns, while it was still above 200 microns, maybe some 10 to 15 years ago. But nevertheless, that is not a huge uh, uh, improvement. And uh, that is the reason, you know, since most of the energy is simply in this uh, uh, silicon wafer, and also the efficiencies, yes, they have gone up, but also not, uh, this is this is a constant but slow process. So while we had maybe system efficiencies of some 15, 16 percent, some 10 to 15 years ago, we're talking about system efficiencies of say 17 to 20 percent today. So you 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 already realize those differences are not that huge, and that's why why I made this comment that these data are still in essence more or less uh, okay. All right, that uh, clarifies a lot, I think. Um, then uh, with one more minute to go, maybe a last question then. Uh, uh, do the EU environmental directives uh, prevent the possibility of rich countries dumping their waste into poor countries without proper waste recycling facilities? For example, Ghana or uh, other African countries. So is there some kind of leg legislation in place to prevent uh, at least not per se dumping maybe but uh, getting rid of the waste there this is a very good question uh, that I'm unfortunately not able to answer simply because I don't know it um, uh, I think these directives but don't uh, you know don't uh, take me too much by the word for this uh, they, they apply in essence, to dealing with these panels in the legal area of the U European Union. And I'm afraid, but not sure, that this does not exclude exporting those panels to outside of the European Union and uh, not knowing anymore what happens there. I'm afraid this may be the case, but I'm not 100% sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, and uh, I think uh, that's also uh, fair to uh, to say that you're not 100 percent sure. And um, maybe one last question from my side, because I, I was quite intrigued by uh, the first solar uh, more service model that you mentioned uh, of taking back all the old panels. Is that something you expect to see more and more coming up? That you move from ownership to more uh, solar as a service, for example. Um. I think this is quite possible. Uh, I, I don't necessarily say it's likely, but it's uh, certainly possible, and it's one of the business models that is definitely uh, in the discussion today. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's because uh, uh, I think uh, that they get the exemption from purely that business model. Of course, uh, offers a lot of opportunities uh, for similar problems. So uh, yeah. once again, uh, Frank, thanks a lot for uh, today's webinar. It's uh, five o'clock, so we filled exactly an hour. Uh, I think uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I hope the audience also enjoyed it a lot. Uh, we'll see each other on the 24th of May at the Asset Circularity uh, Future Grid Lab. And uh, I hope to see more of the audience there. And then, uh, thanks a lot, Frank. One last round of uh, advertisement for the labs. Uh, please check out uh, the programs for the hydrogen, the circularity, and the customer centricity labs. As I explained, we'll uh, take half a day to really take an uh, approach to get an introduction to these topics and go more in depth on a, with case studies, state of the markets and so on. So um, in case of any questions, feel free to uh, drop me an email or give me a call anytime and hope to see all of you there. And uh, thanks a lot for today, Frank, and uh, to the rest of uh, the audience, thanks for joining us and hope to see you at one of our labs. Very good, bye-bye.